means of minor, diverse, versatile, Allah for that. Before I commence, inshallah ta'ala, of course the moments who are joining me here, they don't need an introduction, as I can see from everyone who's here, to come to the front of the I'm joined with Sheikh Abu Sama al Dahabi, our Sheikh, our elder, and I'm joined with Sheikh Rahman al Farouk, who made his way from San Diego to visit everyone in the UK. Zawah Khair. And I'm also joined with Mufti Muhammad Munir from America as well. We have an American lineup, mashallah. So, um, to kickstart the actual event, inshallah ta'ala. I would like uh, our own inshallah respectfully to give uh, three words to the brothers that are here. The brothers should come to Allah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I want to begin by first saying on behalf of the administration here at GLM, I'd like to welcome all of you brothers and all of you sisters to today's program. GLM is an organization and a message that tries to diversify itself in giving dawah to the ummah of al Islam. So we want to help people locally, we want to help people nationally, we want to help people internationally. So there are a lot of initiatives at the masjid that makes the masjid unique. And like every other masjid in the world, it has its efficiencies, but I believe that the good of this masjid is unparalleled. Remember in the month of Ramadan that is passed, in Mecca and Medina, there are always a lot of people praying Tarawih in Mecca and Medina. But I saw a Tarawih prayer in Morocco, and the man was reading Warsh. And there was a gang load of Muslims in Morocco who were praying the Salat of Tarawih. And it wasn't Mecca and Medina. I was blown away and I was amazed at the number of Muslims, the sheer number, the volume of Muslims who were praying in that Maidan. I look at this audience today, and no doubt in the Quran and the Sunnah, we're looking at the majority. The majority is many times criticized in Al Islam. Majority. Allah is Majel sent the religion, and our religion pays attention to the quality. Sometimes numbers they mean a lot. Like the people of the Sunnah, they used to say, between us and them is the Janaza. The Janaza of the people of the Sunnah. You see so many people there. That was a point of having iftikhar, being proud. So I'm proud to be a part of this historic moment that this masjid is packed out like a can of sardines from wall to wall. And I see faces of young Muslims and Muslims who come from all over the place. We're on a journey and we're on different levels in our journey. And in an attempt, inshallah, to get the pleasure of Allah, we have to work together. So as we sit here as du'at, don't look at us as celebrities or special people. We are an extension of you, and you're an extension of us. Don't sit in that audience. You know how that cultural Islam is sometimes. The Sheikh glow in the dark, the Malvi saw, he's flying with the angels. Don't look at us like that. We are an extension of you people. We're here to inspire you young brothers who want to be students. We're here to tell everybody who's here, there's no such thing in our religion as passive participants. We just sit on the side and you don't have anything to do. You have to bring your piece of the puzzle to the table and get in where you fit in to make it do what it gotta do. Everybody out there, right now, in another five, seven, 10, 15 years, inshallah, normative Islam, it may not be so normal because normative, normal Islam is under attack under attack in the world, not just in, you know, the Europe, in Europe, it's under attack. And things that we know as being normal, things are trying to, people are trying to change that. 
so I would be an idiot. Something's wrong with me if I find every reason to hate you and to hate you. Because I can find reasons. I don't like your hat. I don't like how your beard is. I don't like how your thing is, your thing. And I have all of these, re these reasons to be by myself. When in fact, for the most part, we're all trying to do the same thing. So I just want to say that here at Greenwing Mischief, this is what we live for, to worship our lives with each and we thrive in given these opportunities. So if you've never been to this masjid before, this is your masjid, just as much as anybody else's masjid, we want you to continue to come. And we try to make it clear, we try to make it clear that, as I said, Islam is under attack. The Islam that we want to dispense and to share with you people, everyone, is that Wallahi billahi tallahi. We're going to be successful as a community if we just take that Quran and we follow it to the best of our ability, the way Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the rest of those companions followed and understood. What was the religion during their time is the religion now. And what was not the religion during their time is not the religion now. So we just want to welcome all of you. Every single one of you, with a special emphasis and a special shout out to my main man, Dirty Harry. Harun. I have to acknowledge Harun, Dirty Harry. We love you here at GLM, Dirty Harry. So come on and let us work together, inshallah. It's good to see you there today. Assalamualaikum wa and May Allah Azrajal put your efforts in the muwazin of your hasanat. As for the two brothers to my left, they're younger brothers. I was sitting with Mufti yesterday, came to my masjid in Leeds. When I found out that both of them were coming to the UK, I called and I said, I want you to come to Leeds. I want you to come to GLM. Both of them said, okay, no problem. I was sitting with Mufti in my masjid and I said, how many times have we met? And we remembered the times together. We met four or five times. Four or five times. And each one of those times, it was intimate. He graduated. They invited me to a picnic on the roof for his graduation. Everybody left, and him and I sat to the side, and I advised him about my own experiences and what to expect. And he listened to me. And he's always been like that. I went to San Diego where my brother Uthman is from. I think I've been there three or four times. I didn't know him before that. I never met him. But when I went to San Diego, he invited, to me, he invited me to his house. And he put out the Afghani grub. Blew my socks off. I took my shoes off so my toes were doing like this. That food was nice. And the food of my brother Milad. May Allah bless Milad and Abu Milad back in San Diego. Pashtuns, Patans, they have a karam. You ain't seen the lights of it until you go to the crib. So I met Uthman three, four times in my life, both of them, under 10 times. When I met Uthman, I was in his house, in his library. He gave me a, a book, gifted me a book that he wrote. I never heard him speak prior to that. I didn't know him. But listening to him, talking to him, being with him, I left. I didn't have to test anybody. It was like we were on the heart of the same person. But I didn't have suha then. I just looked for myself, how, how he made me feel. Hospitality fed me. So now Allah brings us three together here today. And I hope this is going to be a historic and monumental day in that 20, 20, 35 years from now, people will remember, will remember. Remember we did that thing in Green Lane? So I just want to say to both of them so we can get this party rolling, that I welcome you guys to the shores of the UK. And any hardship you went through, as the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is sallallahu qita'atun min al-adab. Traveling is punishment in and of itself. So I know you guys went through hardships. Just remember 
Prophet Mitchell sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajabin lil amr al-mu'min wa la yakunu dhalika ila al-mu'min The affair of the believer is amazing and that's only for the believer. If good befalls him, he gives shukr to Allah. And if any evil befalls him, he just has sabr and it's good for him. So I apologize if anything happened, but it is what it is and we're about to move forward. So welcome all of you guys, and we want to welcome the brothers. Now let's get it, inshallah. Jazakallah. Inshallah, this discussion, uh, his main objective in the light of Allah is to inspire all of you guys to get involved in da'wah or to somehow support da'wah according to the way of your Lord. Now I'm going to ask, inshallah, Allah, a series of questions the panelists, uh, inshallah, and they're open for all of them to answer. Uh, Mufti and uh, Sheikh Duman, you be sharing that mic, inshallah, to here. And the first question I'd like to put up to the panel, uh, inshallah, is Is giving da'wah something that everyone is expected to do? Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. First and foremost, uh, before I answer, if you don't mind, uh, I just want to say I love you all for the sake of Allah. And the brothers uh, that have come out, and I'm sure in the sisters section, the sisters, uh, many of you I know from other countries, uh, it's really inspired me. And I love you guys, and there's people here, uh, like Brother Nadim, who I knew as a little kid, uh, when I used to live in the UK. And SubhanAllah, it's crazy to see him. We have a brother here, mashallah, uh, Yunus, man. Seattle, over his name. MashaAllah, his parents, both mother and father, they took Shahada and listened to Lester. So, you know, this is something that I'm really, really happy to be here. And with all the drama that you guys have, I told you guys, save it for your mama. <laughs> you, all, you all don't understand. <laughs> but seeing all of you out here, and seeing every masjid that I've been to in every community, and from the awan, from the general masses, the love that I have felt, I just want to say again, I love you all for the sake of Allah. After that, regarding the question, um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sahih Hadith, he told us, Ballibu anni wa This Hadith is a very short, beautiful, and from the miracles of the, of the kalam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the wordings, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because in few words it conveys a deep meaning. Ballighu, this is an amal, this is an order. And we would say this is taklif, not Urdu ya taklif ni ya shah. And I say no, look at that. Taklif here, Arabi meaning that this is a responsibility you have not been made to have, to carry a burden that you have to fulfill. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying go and convey, this is not for just men, not just for women, not just for Arab, not for Ajam, not for this, not race, not just ulama, not the, no, the whole ummah. Anni, who gave us this responsibility? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't have to go to any particular markas or get a certain stamp from a certain publication place or something like this, no. When, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us this, then this is tashreef, sharf, on the Nabi alayhi salatu salam. Walau ayah, ala takfif. Even if it's an ayah, even if it's a verse. Now, istidlal, then you should know what you're talking about. Don't talk about what you don't know about. Don't get into things you don't know about. But if you know something, convey it upon the authority of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. So from this, balimu takfif. Anni tashreef. وَلَوْ آيَةْ تَكْفِيرٌ So what does that tell you? That da'wah is a responsibility of each and every one of us. Men and women. But how will you do it? It doesn't mean that everybody is going to go out to the park and be, be pushing guys and debating and getting into it and telling them, get off me! <laughs> so, not everybody will do that. We're not going to put our sisters in that situation. We're not going to put our children in that situation. We're not going to put the elderly in that situation. But everybody should be involved. I want to explain. I am not the important element of our da'wah. I am maybe the least important. 
But all of you are the most important. Because I could stand there in Balboa Park and talk all day, but that message would be just around us. How does that reach all of I've met two people in just in London that told me you became Muslim just from seeing your video. How did those get there from you? You were involved in it. Brothers, sisters who took that message, who made channels. I don't have an Instagram page. I don't have a TikTok account. I don't have, but my videos are there. How? It's you. You were part of it. Everybody will do their part. Why? Because we do da'wah in accordance with the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi We do not sacrifice on our principles. We do not give up an inch. We do not accommodate. We do not sell out even a little bit. We are who we are. We are on the Qur'an. We are on the Sunnah. We are on the way of the Salaf al-Ummah. We will not apologize for that. We are not apolog apologetics. So when we do da'wah, we look at how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did. He went out to the people, to the kuffar of Quraysh. And he went to them. Most of the he went to them and he spoke to them. Khadija radiyallahu did not go out and go argue with Abu Jahl. No, her da'wah was supporting him. Financially, emotionally, moral, in a moral support. That was her da'wah. Abbas radiyallahu and he had kept his Islam secret at that time. He would give that news to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That was his da'wah. I and mean, everybody needs to be involved in what they can do. Some of you are good in technology. Take the videos, make clips, work on search engine optimization, get the message out there. Some of you are good at you know, raising funds. For me, Allah, I'm telling you, I'm sitting here. You can ask the brothers. I'm not getting paid for this. I paid my own ticket to come here. I'm not doing that. I don't get paid by OMF. I don't get paid by my masjid. But there are people who donated to MF. What did we do? We took that money, we bought containers of English language translations. So that was their da'wah. Everybody has to be involved in the capacity that Allah has blessed them with. If nothing else, you need to be making du'a in the night for the guidance of people. You need to be promoting the du'a. We need to be saying, like, just coming out here, this is something that you are doing and supporting the da'wah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us. Of course, um, I'm happy to be here. It's an honor to be here. There's no need for me to waste any time with the normal formalities or pleasantries. I think the feeling is pretty much mutual for each and every one of us, on one level or another. Those who are speaking, those who are hosting, those who are sitting, those who are standing, those who are watching, inshallah ta'ala. Not uh, too much to add with what he mentioned. It's pretty clear. It's pretty concise. And it's a beautiful fight that would allow him from that hadith that rhymes, huh? Yes. Taklif, wa tashrif, wa takhfif. Alhamdulillah. Uh, just, um, I think that, uh, you know, everyone should just realize that it isn't a choice and it isn't an option. You represent Islam, whether you realize it or not. You walk down the street, you drive down the street, no one looks at, you have a mental problem, you're having a rough day, you're a human being. A Muslim ran into me. A Muslim beat me up. A Muslim went into a place and shot someone. That's, that's how it is. Is it fair? Is it right? If a non-Muslim does it, oh, he had a mental problem. Oh, he was this. Oh, it was that. Oh, 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 oh. No religion, no race, nothing is ever associated with it. But if a Muslim does it from this country, from this land, that's the first thing that's going to come up. If a defense is given, no, that's not true. He never said that, but it's going to come up in the media. So it's not meant to be fair. And if you expect everything to be fair and equal, then it's time to wake up out of that dream. Hayat dunya doesn't always have to be fair, quote unquote. So that's first and foremost. So therefore, everyone has a duty and everyone has a responsibility regardless of your level, how much knowledge you have or how much knowledge you don't have, but your actions, a smile, courtesy, holding the door for someone, thank you very much, have a nice day, etc. So be mindful that your actions are going to speak louder than your words and every single Muslim has a responsibility to give dawah. Based off of the proof and evidence that was already quoted, and many other proofs and evidences from Quran and Sunnah. The Prophet والسلام, as you all know, was commanded to say, Quli, declare. It wasn't something that was 
the inward. It wasn't something that was an uh, issue of creed between the servant and his maker, his lord, Iman, versus Islam. Qul, hadihi sabili. And you can see the consistency of the Qur'an al-Kareem and the consistency of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Once again, tashrif, hadihi sabili. This is my path, my way, my religion, my deen, not apologizing. If they accept the message, alhamdulillah, and if not, you've done your job. And what is your path, O oh Muhammad? What's your sabil? What's your way? What's your practice? Adu ila Allahi ala basiratin. I don't force people. I don't coerce people. I call them. I invite them to the deen. But I invite them with knowledge. Not guessing, not thinking, not fumbling and stumbling, making things up, let alone apologizing to people, watering things down. Basira. That's all you need is accuracy, be sharp in what you say. No matter how concise, how short it may be. And uh, this is my job once again. After Allah Azza wa clearly said, Qul, Sabili, then there's another type of taqid or toqid. Ana, wa man tabani. And all of those who follow me, whether they honestly follow me, those who outwardly follow me, claim to follow me, if you claim to follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you have to give da'wah with a book, with a CD or whatever the case may be. CD may be a little old nowadays, a little old fashioned. You guys get the point that I'm trying to make, right? So, uh, and the last piece of advice, if I can give any, is to be mindful is that Allah Azza wa Jalla is the one who guides. Allah is the one who opens up the hearts and the minds. Don't fight, don't force, don't abuse. All you have to do is make the clear message verbally and more importantly, with your actions. Wallahu a'ala. I would like to add very quickly because inshallah, as we move forward, we have a few questions. So we're going to shorten the questions because we want to get as much in. But I want to connect this to something that we did just now and give dawah to yourselves, women, all of us. The hadith said, As-salat khayrul mawdu'a, prayer is the best thing that you can do. The most the important issue in Islam is the Salah. So all of you coming here for knowledge, there's a lot of rewards in that. But the Salah is the best thing you can do throughout the day. After Tawheed, there's nothing you can do better than Salah. Get serious about our prayer because all these people are here. We miss Fajr, we miss Dhuhr, we miss Maghrib, we're lackadaisical. What's the point with the question about doubt? Our Imam, Zaka'Allah, Hafidullah, Wara'an, he read a surah today for Salat al Maghrib, Surah al Saf. And in that surah, Allah is mentioned, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kunu ansarullahi kama qali bi sabun mani mal hawariyin man ansari ila Allah. That ayah was read to us today. I don't know if he did the amdin, but we're paying attention to the book of Allah. We're not just waiting for the salat get done so we can talk, so we can listen. The most important thing is our connection to Allah. Stop lolly gagging about the prayer. There's no khayr if we're not holding on to the prayer as an ummah. Anyway, that ayah says, O oh, you who believe, be helpless to Allah. I'm sorry, Allah. O oh, you who believe, that's everybody in here. Be helpless to Allah in the same way that he Maryam said to the disciples, who from amongst you will be from the Ansar Allah, Allah's helpers. So I just thought that it was hikmah from him reading that ayah, and I just want to take that ayah out to say, as salat as salat ummat al-Islam. Look at yourself. If you're not praying, it's problem. But as it relates to the ayah, that ayat is telling all of us, if you are Muslim, you have to somehow, some way, try to fit in and give some kind of doubt. May Allah help us to be from the Ansar of Allah The next question, inshallah, to the panel is, life is full of ups and downs, and it's a journey, of course, and that one itself can be a journey. So, what difficulties may a person face on 
الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. يعني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أشد بلان أنبياء. And the hardest tested are the أنبياء ثم الصالحين. And then after that are the most pious. يعني in those in the status of their piety. So if you look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is always filled with a lot of hardship, tests, trials. But that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing that great Jannah for us. This dunya is not forever. This dunya is not meant for you to يعني, wild out and do whatever you want. This dunya is a test. It is the building ground. Right? So when you go through those hardships for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're patient. And by patient, I mean you persevere through it. Not that you just cuss and get upset and give up and kick doors and then you're like, I'm patient. Well, no, you're just like another option after that. <laughs> but when you're patient, when you have sabr for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise your ranks in Jannah. So with da'wah, you will face many types of hardships. And when you look at the da'wah of the anbiya, we will face similar hardships. Not as much as them, but similar. So when they start calling towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people would first try to drown their voice out. They would try to argue, debate. And when that didn't work, then it would be thrown in the fire. I mean, or assassination of the Prophet ﷺ when they gather around his house. You know? So we're going to face this. And we're going to face it at different levels depending on our religiousness. The more Allah, you're closer to Allah, the harder you'll be tested. But don't let that be a deterrence because that test will raise your ranks in general. In dunya you will get tested. You will have hardships. People be hating on you. But then you know what you're doing is right. One of the earlier salaf, he was asked about a person. When he asked them, they said about him that nobody dislikes him. Everybody loves him. Nobody's ever spoken ill about him. He said, then that is somebody who's never spoken the truth. When you speak the haq, when you're unapologetic with your da'wah, then you're going to get haters. You're going to get people going to try to use violence against you. People are going to try to use the law against you. But if you have istiqamah, if you are steadfast on sticking to your principles, as in our time, sticking to the Qur'an and Sunnah, sticking to the way of the Salaf, if you do not deviate, then Allah will grow your da'wah. Allah will raise your hands. And Allah will put that ajr for you in the akhirah. So whatever hardships you face, whether it's from your own family, whether it's from your community, whether it's being getting a label put on you, whether it's from the, the, the groups that will come out and try to stop your da'wah, we have to continue what we're doing because we are doing it for the sake of Allah. No. Next question, inshallah. Now, of course, um, with difficulties, inshallah, something that we need to keep in mind is being consi consistent. How do we stay consistent, inshallah, in our dawah? Bismillah. How to stay consistent in your dawah? There's several ways. First and foremost is dua. And we all know from the Prophet Wasallam's supplications was for Allah to make him firm and to keep him firm. Rather, we say in our salah each and every single day, the Prophet Wasallam he declares that there's no prayer without the recitation of the Fatiha, Ihdina Surat al-Mustaqim, guide us to the straight path. Now stop and ask yourselves, if you're a Muslim, born and raised, reverted, converted, whatever word you wish to use, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you come from a long line of Muslims, you believe in the law in the last day, why do you ask Allah to guide you to the straight path? Do you have doubt that Islam is the straight path? Are you trying to figure it out? What's the wisdom behind that? Over and over and over and over again, asking Allah to guide you to something that you're already upon, inshallah. What's the wisdom behind that? Then the two main wisdoms mentioned by the people of knowledge, and I'm sure you've heard the answer before, and that is, tathbitul mawjud wa tahsilul ma'dum. It's to solidify, consolidate what you already have, meaning you're already a Muslim. 
You've been a Muslim, raised, born Muslim 10, 20, 50 years, but you constantly ask for more. So you just look at the basic teachings of Surah Al-Fatiha. If you're reflecting on Surah Al-Fatiha, I don't think it's so much rust that you'll get on your soul, on your mind, and your heart, if you're really thinking about it. Let alone to remain consistent. You may have guidance now, doesn't mean you have it tomorrow. You may be busy with Dawah today. This one doesn't want to speak with me anymore. My wife got a divorce from me. I lost money. This happened to me. They threatened me. They sh try to shut me down, etc., etc., etc. There's so many different things that can come to prevent you from being consistent. And that's why you ask Allah, oh Allah, solidify me. Keep me bolstered, keep me firm, keep me anchored upon what you already gave me, and please, Allah, give me more. So this is one of the ways of remaining uh, consistent in giving da'wah. Number two is as long as there's a need for da'wah, then there's a need for da'wah. There's still kufr, there's still shirk, there's still innovations, there's still ignorance and sin and heedlessness, so therefore there's always going to be, need, be a need for someone who calls away from that shirk and that kufr and those innovations and those sins and that heedlessness. So it's, it's supply and demand. As long as there are customers, then we need to have products. You don't like money, you don't need the money anymore, it doesn't feel good working and serving your business, your family business, you don't, you don't find any pleasure in your restaurant. As long as people are lining up, then the restaurant needs to be open and the shelves need to be stopped. So as long as there's a need for people to be guided and reminded, then there's gonna be a need for someone to guide them through Allah's guidance and to remind them by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last but not least, last but not least, I would say is sympathy and empathy. How would you feel if someone saw your family member lost, misguided, and walked the other way? How would you feel? And this is one of the secrets behind the Prophet sallallahu stating, Al-Imanu bid'un wa sittuna shu'ba. Fa'alaha qulu la ilaha illallah. Is that Iman has over 60 levels, 60 branches, 60 stations. The highest obviously being the Kalim of Tawheed. And the lowest of those stations is to remove something harmful from the road. The Prophet then states, and what Hayau Shu'batun min al-Iman. And shyness is a part of faith. Why did the Prophet say this? He said the top, and he said the, 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 the bottom, quote-unquote, relatively speaking. The highest and the lowest. What's the point of him saying shyness is a part of faith? Wouldn't it have been enough to say this is one, and this is number 60, and shyness is a part of faith? What's the, what's the hikmah behind that? The people of knowledge, they say, is that there isn't a level, there isn't a station of iman, Except that it is based off of shyness, haya. And Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, he, he brings up the argument and the discussion of al-haya and al-hayat. Al-hayatu, life. Al-hayatu, shyness. And he, he brings up the discussion and the argument, which of the two words, which comes first? What's derived from what? The chicken or the egg, the egg or the chicken. Is hayatu from hayatu? Or is Hayatu from Hayau? And he states that Hayat, shyness, is the foundation of everything, life. And a person, he says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah because he's shy to stand in front of his maker, knowing that Allah created him, made him, fed him, gave him all of his blessings, and he called upon a partner. That's embarrassing, that's shameful. And also, the lowest part of faith is to remove something harmful from the road. Aren't you shy and embarrassed? You walk past glass and you see somebody walk into the glass. You walk past something that's littered on the floor and you just, you just don't care. But you don't think that someone sees you. And then you say, oh man, I didn't know you was watching me. You feel embarrassed, right? So how would you feel if that was your mother, your son, your daughter, clearly upon misguidance? Why didn't you say nothing to my family? Why didn't you stop my son? It's an embarrassment. So there's always a need to give da'wah, and if there's always a need to give da'wah, then you need to remind yourself, it's not about me. I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I'm aggravated. You have to keep giving it because you have to be too shy to see the people upon misguidance. You eat, you drink, you go to sleep, you live a comfortable lifestyle, and you believe, you believe 
that they're going to a place that isn't a pleasant place. That's really messed up. And this is why many people, when they accept Islam, they have a derogatory, they, they feel some type of way, certain Muslims. I had Muslim customers come into my bar, come into my restaurants for 20 years, and not one of them called me to Islam. 20 years. All of those people from this country, from that country, not once did they invite me to the religion. You're the first person to say, hey, come be a Muslim. It's shameful. So we need to remind ourselves of these realities. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Inshallah, next question is, uh, you see that, mashallah, the masjid is filled with brothers, alhamdulillah, I But this question, inshallah, is regarding sisters. In what ways can sisters get involved in da'wah? <laughs> in what ways can sisters get involved in a da'wah? There's a principle that comes to us from the authentic sunnah of al-Mustafa al-Mukhtar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is important, guys, especially women, because as we learn in our madhabs and in our culture, sometimes because women don't know this principle, we do things that we shouldn't do. So remember this hadith, go back and check it out. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in Nisa'u, shaqa'iqu rijal Women are the twins to the men. Men and women are twins. The meaning of that, everything that is applicable to the men, everything in the religion that is applicable, that Allah told you to do, pray, fast, zakat, Ramadan, uh, hajj, umrah, everything, down, everything that Allah told the men to do, women have to do it. And they do it in the same exact way, unless there's a delil that comes to say, don't do it the same way. So when the men pray, we have the imam standing in front of everybody. But when the women pray, it's different. The imam of the lady stands in the middle in the same row with the women. She doesn't stand in front. If the male imam makes a mistake, we the men say to him, subhanallah. But if the women are there and they check out the mistake, they clap their hands. Men fast in the month of Ramadan, we pray. Women, they fast and they pray. But there's a time when they can't pray. So that scene is different. So the way the prophet prayed from the beginning of the tekbir to the ikram until the taslim, everything he did, the women should do it exactly the same. Unless there's a delil that comes to show it's different. So as it relates to dawah, there are proofs that show women don't do everything the same as it relates to dawah. Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَطُرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَا تَبَرَّجُ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ الْأُولَى You women, stay in your homes. And don't make the display like the times of people of Jahiliya before Al-Islam, when the women used to come out, they had bangles, they had high heel shoes, they had uh, perfume, they walked seductively, some of them, to attract the attention. Of many. So Allah told women in the sand, stay in your homes. But if you have to come out to go to work, to go to school, to visit people, then you have to come out a particular way. So the dawah, it requires that the lady has to understand. She's not going to come up on this stage and talk to men. The Prophet says, Allah, why you send them? If a woman goes out of her house, shaitan beautifies her. Even with jilbab, niqab, shaitan beautifies her. For the one who sees that lady in this society, he says, I wonder what's that about. So she's encouraged to stay in the house. So we're not going to let the woman come here and get down in front of people. Because that's not appropriate. So she should give dawa to the men. Our mother aunt, she should give dawa to the women. And if she gives dawa, if she gives dawa to men, she does it the way our mother Aisha, who was a scholar, radiallahu anha. They said, like Anas ibn Malik said, the men of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, if we ever had ikhtilaf, we went to Aisha and she knew the truth of the mas'ala. A lot of the hidden sunnah 
comes from Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. So if the lady is going to give dawah to the men, it's from behind a hijab. So when the companions used to make hajj with the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu after his death, just like doing his life, his life he put him, they put him in a canopy because he didn't want the women mixing with the men, especially the wives of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So lastly, and I thank Allah for this, you guys are young, 25, 30 years ago in Medina, when we embraced the Salafia, for me, the prime style on the scene who benefited me was none other than the Imam Al Imam Al Sheikh Nasr Al Din Al Bang. He had a position he used to talk about, he used to encourage the women, but he used to tell them, you get down and you learn. But she can't make khuruj, for an example, for 30 and 40 days and stay in a masjid. She has to take care of her responsibilities at first in her home, to her husband, to her children. The hadith said that any woman who prays five times a day, five times a day, sister, salat al-fajr on time, all of the prayers, jubba, niqam, all that's beautiful. We have to pray. A salat a salat. So in this case, whoever, the woman, Obey, she prays five times a day, fast in the month of Ramadan, and listens to her husband, she'll be able to go into any door of the Jannah that she wants to. Any door of the Jannah. Dawah is important. But what about the Dawah to her children? That's the first Dawah. So that's what Ellen Ban used to tell sisters. They were pumped up. Let's get out here. Let's give this Dawah. That's good, he would say. But you have to have filth. You have to have understanding. Dawah is to your children first. Dawah to your children and to those who are close to you. And dawah for the woman is in a way that is not like we're giving dawah. There are some distinctions and differences. So we encourage those women to give dawah. Some of the older sisters who came to Al Islam, the Iran Islam, the older women, they help those sisters. They give them dawah. The girl accepts Islam and she's a brand spanking new Muslim. She's brand new. And then the people come to her and say, My Inshallah, sister, you know, if you get married, you complete half of your religion. She doesn't know. She says, okay, okay, I'm ready. She's not ready. And then they bring her a brother who is horizontally challenged. I don't want to say midget. He's horizontally challenged. He's short. She's a tall lady. She wouldn't check for that man in Jahiliya before. So she wouldn't check for him. But the sisters say, love, man, love the dean, the dean. That brother loved the dean. She said, play yani, <laughs> But the sister's around her. Sister, half your dean. It's a good brother. It's a good. The other sisters who have experience say, nah, sister, nah. Pump your brakes. We saw that movie before. We read that script before. So it's like us. When I accepted Islam, Islam in America, I embraced Islam with Asians, Pakistanis, and Bangladesh. When I accepted Islam, they said, okay, we're going to give you a name. All right, what's my name? They said, Bilal. <laughs> said, I don't want that name. Not because obviously I'm not against Bilal, but why I got to be Bilal? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Well, Allah, I'm serious. Why I have to be Bilal? Why we all have to be Bilal? But that's how they were thinking at that time. So the older brothers were the ones who schooled me. So that's the dawah. And again, that's why we said, and I'm finished, there are no passive participants in Al-Islam. Khayrukum and fa'akum nas The best person here is the one who brings most benefit to the other people. And the sister has a responsibility to give da'wah within the boundaries and demarcations of the sharia. And Allah is a'la and a'la. Inshallah, this uh, question I want to influence on um, and it's more personally to each individual. Uh, and the question is, what or who influenced you to give down in the style that you do, in the style that you do to the style that you do? Hold on, you might know what I'm going to answer. <laughs> 
Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam ala Rasulillah. To be very honest with you, and I don't need to sugarcoat anything, um, the hood influenced my down. <laughs> I hadn't studied, I, when I first went out, I hadn't uh, taken any classes, I didn't know any du'at, I didn't watch YouTube videos. Um, I was raised in what we call the barrio, or the hood, like a bad neighborhood, and raised with some misguided friends. And those of you who know my story, you know. If you don't know, then you don't know. <laughs> um, when I saw people that I grew up with, and the way we were, we, we didn't hide who we were. I mean, we used to wear clothing that would clearly identify us as gang members. And we took heat from it, from the police, from other gangs, from regular people. But we never cared. When we felt a certain way, we said it. If we thought something to be right, we repped it. So when I went towards the religion, alhamdulillah, I realized Islam is the truth. I realized Christianity and Judaism and other religions, from my own study and my own opinion, had been diluted and things had been changed. So for me, since I took this to be the truth, I, I, I felt a responsibility to go out to the people in my neighborhood, people that I grew up with, and just go, I mean, at the time, we'd just go down to bad neighborhoods and just stand on the street corner dressed in a way that would represent me as a Muslim. So I wasn't shy, I didn't have to simulate I would stand out, but I wanted to stand out because I wanted people to know I'm different. I'm not like everybody else. Because if I'm like everybody else, then why should they come to me and my message? And I would speak to people straight, sometimes in ways that later on I decided I shouldn't speak to, you know. But it was straight, and that's what inspired me. The fact that these people are going to go to the hellfire if they die on kufr was enough motivation for me that I had to go tell them in the best way possible, but in the direct way possible. Never apologizing, never sacrificing, and unapologetic, uncompromising, speaking the truth. And if somebody didn't like it, we didn't care. Just like back in the days when somebody didn't like what I said, whatever. So that, that is what influenced me. After that, alhamdulillah, when I started to <coughs> seek knowledge and sit with the ulama, their advice and their guidance helped me grow. But sometimes you just gotta keep it real. Say it as it is. And that's what it is. Who inspired me or what inspired me in giving dawah or my style or technique in dawah, etc.? Um, countless people, to be honest with you. Count, countless brothers. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's a fact. Uh, whether it be my local masjid, and uh, in my city, representing Philly, Masjid al Mujahideen, uh, the local Imam there, may Allah have mercy upon his soul. No doubt, he influenced me directly and indirectly. And many of the older brothers in that masjid, I will look up to them. Uh, you know, I'll be amazed on Friday, on Jumwa. You know, it, it was always something that had an impact on me when I was uh, a young Muslim in the masjid. And if any of the brothers uh, from Message of Mujahideen you know, are watching or listening, they know that I'm not making this up. And of course, uh, other brothers in my city, Philadelphia, whether they were from West Africa or the Middle East or from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, or whether they, like I said, from the hood, you know what I'm saying, from West Philly. You know, I'm not from no, you know, I never had a silver spoon in my mouth. It wasn't the worst part of Philly. It wasn't the, the you know, the craziest part, but it was, it was rough. We went through rough times. And uh, that's very important that you brought up because that builds character. That makes you, that builds, you know, strength. What's important is, is that there were countless brothers when I was younger, uh, elementary school, middle school, let alone in high school, that influenced me to learn, to study, to give dawah. Brothers that came from Medina, and I've mentioned my story many, many times before of, you know, what got me started. And it's difficult to mention one specific person, so on and so forth. As far as what uh, helped develop or create my style, my way of speaking and talking, so on and so forth, then there's also countless influences. Um, my late father, may Allah have mercy upon his soul. Uh, I don't want to get too dramatic, but it's, it's a real true story. Um, Alhamdulillah, my father, he was always in my life. 
And of course, there were things that took place between him, my mother, so on and so forth, us growing up, you know, but he was always in our lives, always. And, uh, you know, I always loved him. And we always had a good relationship. You know, life happens, ups and downs, so on and so forth. So when I went to Medina, and I was busy, busy, busy studying, traveling, Medina, Yemen, blah, 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 blah. I didn't see him as much, but I would see him from time to time in the summer. And, uh, you know, he would say things to me like, you know, I, I see you. Don't think I don't know who you are. I remember one time he said to me, he said the Grand Mufti, right, as a joke. Like, like don't think I don't know what you're doing, son. I see you, right? You know, mashallah. And he would say things to me in Arabic, so, so forth. So going back and forth, Medina, you know, I came home one summer. And he said to me, son, you know, let's get together. Let's have lunch. I said, sure. He says, I know you're busy. I know you know this big shot, but make some time for your old man. I said, no problem. So we got together. We were eating food, so on and so forth, and we were talking. And hindsight, looking back now, I realized that my father was dying. And he knew he was dying. He had cancer, and it was severe. But for one reason or another, he didn't tell me, he didn't tell most of us that he was fighting and battling cancer. So now looking back, I see his wisdom, all right? I see his wisdom. And he said something that was very, very profound, and it, it, it stuck with me to this very day, and it's a big part of my da'wah and how I like to give da'wah. People say, what is a hadith disciple? Who's a hadith disciple? What do you mean disciple, right? And I remember when I was younger, going back, he told me the statement of Imam Shafi'i. He said it in Arabic. Al-waqtu kasayf illam taqta'hu qapa'ak. He would say, time is like a sword. If you don't cut it or cut with it, it will cut you. But anyhow, we're having lunch. And he says to me, he says, listen, Muhammad. He says, I see you. I hear you, mashallah. I see what you're doing, right? He says, I want to share something with you. And obviously, I found out later on that this was a statement of a very famous, iconic person whose name I won't mention. He said the following points. He says, number one, research your own. Number two, retain what's useful. Number three, discard, which is unuseful. And number four, ultimately build your own or create your own. Research your own, meaning by yourself. Keep everything that's beneficial that you research. No matter who it comes from or how it comes, keep it. And if it doesn't work, if you don't agree with it, if it's of no use, discard it. And last but not least, create your own style. Don't follow no one, blindly follow anyone, copycat or mimic anybody. And then, obviously, shortly afterwards, he passed away. May Allah have mercy on him. I mean. And I realized now is that that was his last and final thing that he could give me. And he was basically saying, it's nothing else I can teach you. It's nothing else I can give you. I wish things would have been better, more perfect, but at least take this last gym and try to remember it. And since then, that's what I've tried to make that in my dawah is to research, study, benefit. You got to be intellectual. And the foundation of the whole entire concept, the way of the Salaf is Salih, is ilm, is knowledge. Who are the Salaf? How do we know about them except through ilm, except through books, except through their legacy? So you got to research. And that's something I've tried to do. I've tried to do. I'm not saying that I do it. I try to do. Number two is that anything that's benefit in the hikmat of Allah to the woman, wherever you find the wisdom, you take the wisdom. A woman, she doesn't ask, where did the pearls come from? Who picked up the oyster? How did you open up the oyster or the clam? Were your hands clean? Was it a black person, a white person, a yellow person, a red person? What seed did it come from? But she takes the pearls and she wears the pearl necklace. So you're supposed to take hikmah, you're supposed to take the pearl from wherever it comes from. Last, uh, thirdly, discard that which uh, Sheikh Fulan said it, Brother Fulan does it, Alhamdulillah, but it doesn't work for me. I don't see it practical or I don't agree with it. Or I don't think that the hadith is authentic, so I'm only going to stick to what I believe in. And last but not least, make your own, create your own, have your own style. You know your audience, he knows his audience better than me. I can't tell him what to say, how to speak. I can't say, Sheikh Abu Sana, why it is. This is his audience, it's his experience. So me personally, that, that's how I look at it, is your dawah has to be based off of knowledge, facts, hardcore knowledge, not ignorance. Number two, keep anything that's a benefit, anything that isn't a benefit, respectfully get rid of it, and most importantly, be yourself, be unique, 
Don't worry about the people accepting you, rejecting you, smiling or frowning. Just keep it real. Be yourself and speak to the people from your heart. And you will be shocked at the results that you get. Allah <laughs> Allah. Um, I just want to say that I'm happy, man. I'm happy that Mufti is here because he's inspiring me. You guys know I am a Black Lives Matter man. <laughs> Meaning what? Coming from America, they, they police us differently. We have a background. It's tough. I go to America, the cop will crack my head open just because of my color. Black Lives Matter. They'll shoot my daughter who stopped at a red light just because of her color. We have to deal with those realities. So when he starts mentioning names like his dad, wallahi, I stand on the shoulders of his dad, pioneer, African Americans. Not to mention the jewels that he's dropping. I'm happy that this man is here today. He mentioned in Philadelphia, an imam who died, he didn't call his name, I'm gonna call his name. An imam Asim, rahmatullahi. I stand on that man's shoulders back in Philly, where our brother Dr. Tahir Wyatt is, trying to do what? Give dawah to the whole community of our people, not to this, this corner of people over here, working with the community of Al Imam Asim, Rahmatullahi. So I know that my people are watching this right now back in Philly, and I'm going to give a shout out to all of them people. African Americans who preceded us. They didn't hear about the Sunnah like us. And Imam Siraj Wahaj, every time I go to America, and Imam Siraj Wahaj gives me access to his masjid, there's a lot of people there, and he sits right there in the front row with his legs crossed like that. Gives me love. How am I going to help? How am I going to help not respect and love that man? I'm going to come and call him a muqtadi. No, I stand on that man's shoulders. Do I agree with everything he says and does? No, how can I? And he doesn't agree with everything that I say. But he's my peoples and I'm his peoples. So I pray to Allah that Allah bless all those brothers, help them to get on the same page, inshallah, azajal. and those brothers who have knowledge of the sunnah and they are educated, you can't continue to be stuck on stupid with the way some of us are moving and thinking. As for me, this is an easy question, hands down. When I went to Medina, I was 22, 23 years old, and I went to the road of the Prophet And when I was there for Maghrib, there was an African man talking, facing the Qibla, but sitting next to the roba, he didn't have any microphone. And there was a circle around him of men from Uzbekistan. They looked Chinese. They were elderly Chinese looking men. They had books that turned out to be Sahih Muslim on this day. And the pages were yellow. And the big books were quite big. And everyone who wanted to sit in that halaqa had to sit behind those Chinese men. So I stood there and I said, wow, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> I was blown away. We're going to call me a dining shower. Got to get some more tea, man. <laughs>
اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم رب هذه الدعوه التامه والصلاه القائمه ات محمد وسيم الفضيله وبعث مقام محمود الذي وعدته When I looked at Sheikh, the Sheikh, he was speaking Fusha in a way that was different. It was Fusha, but he was pronouncing the end of his words in a way that was different from what we were learning in the show. And it was just magnetic. I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was transfixed, mesmerized. And I sat down. I understood what he was saying, and I was learning Arabic in the process. I walked up to him after the salat was going off, and I shook his hand, and the sheikh's hand was so big that my hand was miniature, and he was a big guy, Sheikh Umar Falata, Abdul Ila, Abu Abdul Ila. His son was our teacher in the show as well. Tremendous man. And I started going to his class from that point on. Now what impressed me about his teaching style, he was johari. He was strong in his voice. You go on the internet and just put his name in, Umar Falata. And he was talking. Now as he was talking and he was reading the tafsir of the hadith, the sheikh would read one hadith, innama al-amalu bin-niyat. He started that hadith. He started explaining it. That sheikh went all the way to Mirpur, all the way to Timbuktu, all the way over there to Somali, or to Basaso. Went all the way over. He was all over the place. To the point where you forgot what the original hadith was because he just had you traveling. And then when the Mu'edhin went up those stairs, he could see the Mu'edhin, and lo and behold, he brought that hadith right back to Inna Mala'amalu Bina Niyah. And you'd be like, whoa, the shape is high power nitroglycerin. The way he talked, I tried to do that. But as I get older, I used to remember what I was, but now you'd be forgetting, you'd be making that point, you'd be saying, what was I talking about again? Because you get older, but the sheikh was something else. That's number one. The second one is a sheikh from Ethiopia. His name was his name was Muhammad Aman Al Jami, Rahmatullahi Ali. They oppressed him by calling him Jami Yun, Jamis. And the Imam, the Sheikh Muhammad Aman Al Jami, he didn't throw people off of the Sunnah. He didn't throw people off a set of fear for mistakes. He wasn't like that. It's oppressive, yeah, he don't call him people jammy. He's not what you find today. He was ra'uf and rahim and gentle and knowledgeable. So when I saw him, he was doing natal altar. And you can hear he wasn't Arabic. He wasn't an Arab, but the way he spoke Arabic was amazing, and he taught us the Aqidah of al wasati and that man was Mutamekkin in Aqidah. So both of those two were the two that had a great impact on me more than anyone. But I got to acknowledge Al-Imam Al-Albani in terms of just sheer knowledge and the way he was, making Al-Hadith beloved to us. And the people of Hadith, the way he was, was amazing. But in terms of people who I knew when I met, it was those two Imams. And I ask Allah by his ism and adam, to have mercy upon them and to forgive them and to put them into the Jannah to Firdaus without any adab and any he said. Inshallah, the time has really gone away from us. And I know we wish we had more time on the stage and more time to listen to the, to the speakers here, inshallah. Um, we're going to wrap up, inshallah, final advice uh, and then we can uh, start salat al Isha. Uh, as my brother in Islam, and alhamdulillah, as all my brothers in Islam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us a deen of nasiha. Nasiha is well wished. So I just want to clarify something, and I hope you will take it as a nasiha. Just so people don't twist his words. 
We don't support the BLM movement or organization. Because that organization supports things that we as Muslims cannot support. That's right. Right? Absolutely. That's right. As somebody who grew up, and I'm going to have to rep now, on the West Coast, in Cali, in Southern California, in San Diego, I've been through those struggles where you would get judged by the color of your skin, where being a teenager of a certain complexion made you the target of police, made you the target of discrimination. And we played with it. I mean, just be honest with you. At that time, we played with it. We'd go to a store, me and some of my friends would be dressed as gangster as it could be, bandanas and all, and we'd have a little white friend dressed up like a nerd. And he would steal everything in that store because they'd be watching us. <laughs> I'm going to be real about it. You know what, rather, you shouldn't have invited me. All of you are my people. If you're black, you're white, you're Asian, Pakistani, Afghani, Indian, Chinese, I don't care. If you're Muslim, if you're upon La ilaha illallah, if you're upon the Kitab wa Sunnah, you are my people. And we, as Muslims, must, we must structure our lives and our da'wah in accordance with the way of Rasulullah I get asked a lot, how do you be patient in the face of a lot of people who will be ignorant towards you? And there were times where you might have knocked the brother out without even giving him a chance. Now at least I let him know, like I'll knock you out. <laughs> but there were times when I wouldn't have been that patient. Wallahi, it is the seerah of our beloved Nabi alayhi salatu salam that inspires me. That takes me back to patience. When we do da'wah, we don't need to invent new ways. We need to go back to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the way of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the way of the Salat al Where the da'wah was coupled with patience. In Ta'if, in Mecca, in times of jihad and others, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was faced with greater hardship than we face. And he had more ability to react to them. He had more strength than a regular man. He had the power of Allah behind him. He could have had the mountain of Taif closed and the people destroyed, but he made dua for them. And he was patient. So our patience should be based on the Quran and Sunnah, the way of the Salaf al Ummah, and on sabr, on patience. Because we need to know that those people, that if they don't correct their way, they will end up in the fire. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us sabr, to make us from the du'at. Uh, I had to go a lot earlier. I have some things to do, but I stayed just because I love all of you for the sake of Allah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for my sins and any mistakes I make, the brothers here are free from. And any mistakes they make, I am free from. We all come together for the sake of Allah because we are believers in the Quran. We are believers in the Sunnah. We are those that love Abu Hanifa, who love Imam Malik, who love Imam Shafi'i, who love Imam Ahmad, and all of the Salaf of this Ummah, and those righteous scholars that followed their way. And we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from us. The last thing I will say, the key ingredient missing in a lot of da'wah today is ikhlas. It's sincere. And I'm not pointing at any particular person. I ask Allah myself, first and foremost, that Allah gives me ikhlas. But if our da'wah is based on sincerity, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise the da'wah. If our da'wah starts to be towards a particular person, then our da'wah, even if it apparently, even if it apparently is successful, in the end, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will have nothing, and that's a failure. But jazakumullah wa ta'ala. I'm going to give each... Uh, I wish you had more time, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, ask Allah to accept it from everyone that came, inshallah. We're going to have to wrap up with the last. Uh, Imam Khaisab was waiting for his salah, and uh, he, the time was going to be done. So, brothers, inshallah, accordingly, just make the rumors.